Remember who told you about Jesus Christ? How many say, I remember, Pastor? How many would say it was a mom or a dad? Mom or dad? Who else? A friend. A friend. A preacher? Co-worker? Aren't you glad somebody cared? Aren't you glad the Lord cared? <laughs> well, man, have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 4. Thank you, Brother John. That was tremendous tonight. Powerful message. Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles with us tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back. Even though you knew I'd be here, I appreciate that very much. Matthew chapter 4. We look tonight at the Word of God. Continuing our theme, Only God, and I've tagged onto the sermon tonight three little words every single day. I'm going to kind of tell you where I'm going tonight, and then we'll get there. But I'm going to ask you tonight for a commitment for 21 days. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to ask you to commit to spend time with God every day for 21 days. At the end of the service, the usher will hand out a card. And I'm out to ask, I'm telling you where we're going tonight, and I'll tell you why we get there. Even if you already spend time with God every day, that you would sign your name and commit to spend 21 days. Sometime every day with God in God's Word. Matthew chapter 4. When I was in college, I had a class called New Testament Survey. Did not know when I started the class everything that would entail in the class, but one particular assignment has stuck with me since that freshman Bible class of New Testament Survey, second semester, when I was in college. And the assignment that they had us do was to know the chapter content of every chapter in the New Testament. Now, I cannot, if you ask me right now, identify every chapter content tonight in the New Testament. But I am surprised how much has stuck with me over the last almost 20 years. Well, that sounds like a long time. Uh, 20 years now, or a little over 20 years, when I had that one semester, maybe two credit class to know every chapter in the New Testament what God was talking about I have not forgotten yet the content of Matthew chapter 4 in Matthew chapter 4 we come to the temptation of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 Jesus the Son of God is led into the wilderness to be tempted by none other than the great deceiver himself Jesus, the Son of God, all God and all man, has now been in the temptation, the wilderness, for 40 days and has not eaten. A long time by any stretch. In fact, if we miss a meal, we become hangry. And life ceases to exist until our belly is satiated and satisfied. And Jesus now has gone 40 days, has entered this temptation with the devil. The devil comes and he, tri he tempts our Lord and tests him three different ways. The very first temptation, he tempts Jesus and kind of instructs him encourages him. He says, turn those stones into bread. Now, I will not say all that I could about this, but sometimes I talk about food at church. Sunday mornings, I talk about steak, succulent steak, warm apple pie, bread that is hot out of the oven. When I wasn't on the keto, I could enjoy it. Now my kids almost rub it in my face while they enjoy it. Choose your poison, pizza with the cheese dripping off the edge. Hot wings. Hot wings. I like hot wings. Mac and cheese. There's not much food I don't like, to be quite honest. 
Can you imagine when the devil tempted Jesus Christ not to have eaten for 40 days to say, listen, turn that into some bread? And as a man in humanity, all of the thoughts that would have come rushing on the human level of our Savior, Jesus Christ, bread. Bread that I remember eating 40 days ago. Bread like my mother Mary used to make that I haven't had for 40 days. Bread that my friend down the street, his mom made that I haven't had for 40 days. Bread like maybe a grandparent to someone else in the family. Bread like the vendor down the street. Bread would have come back and Jesus rebuked the devil and answered the devil in verse number 4 of Matthew chapter 4 where he said this. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus reminded the devil of Scripture. He reminded the deceiver of a tremendous truth that the devil still tempts and trips up Christians to this day. The temptation was, Jesus, you don't need to do anything else until you satisfy your temporal, earthly needs. The most important thing that you have to do right now is to take care of you on an earthly sense. Turn those stones into bread. You're hungry, Jesus. You're, you're in need right now. You have a problem, and you can solve that problem. In fact, I'm not stopping you from your earthly ministry. I'm not hindering you in the miracles that you're going to do or the leprosy that you will heal, the demons that you will cast out, the lame that will walk or the blind cause to see. No, no, just take care of this particular need right now and make that your focus. You can't tell me in 2021 that the devil has come up with any new tricks. It's the same old story. The same old tricks. The same old liar. Don't forget, the devil is a liar. Everything he says is a lie. There is no truth, the Bible says, in the devil. He is a liar. If he tells you something, you can categorically reject it. It is a lie. So welcome to 2021. When what we need, what we need is a little more freedom. What we need is life to return to normal. That's what it have us to believe, is it not? And yet Jesus answers. He says, as it is written, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And my friend, my challenge to you tonight is that you begin to eat, partake, consume true, sustaining life every single day. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you'd help me and help us. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need your help and service. We're asking for your spirit to touch us, to convict us. Lord, to correct us where we need correcting, to inspire us. Lord, to comfort. We're asking that we would see you tonight, Lord. May we long past and we remember where we were at or who spoke. Lord, would we remember the truth from your word and the life-changing force that it is. And Lord, I pray that tonight, that everyone here under the sound of my voice, whether they're online or in this building, would commit for the next 21 days to spend time in your word every single day. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I began the service and I told you where I'm going tonight. You can reject it, you can refuse it, but that's where I'm going tonight. Now I'm going to show you how we get there. 
That verse, Matthew 4, 4, ought to be enough. Should it not be? We don't need more than one statement from our Lord for it to be true and for us to obey. Yet we are stubborn, stubborn people, are we not? We are not easily convinced. Oh, I know the Lord says that, but does, does it really mean every single day? Is it really the most needful thing to, to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? The whole counsel of God. You, you mean, I, I get the fact that I love to read the Psalms, but Pastor, you mean that Jesus includes Chronicles? Yes. Includes Chronicles. And when you start to get into Chronicles, it's a pretty neat book. That God has such a careful attention to detail. There are stories and there's events and Chronicles. Boy, just catch you off guard. Are there some other things that are kind of weighty? No doubt about it. Every word. Only God every single day. I want us to understand a few things tonight before I challenge us in this way. Understand that the Word of God is inspired by God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God's Word, this Word that we're able to hold in our hands or on our telephones, on our, on our tablets, is the inspired, the literal God-breathed Word of God. Jesus is called the Word. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Second Peter it says it this way, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, this book was not authored by an ordinary author. This book was authored by none other than God Himself. Only God. Only God. This book is not a collection of fallacies and fables, but is fundamentally founded for our faith. God's Word, inspired, God-breathed. There is not an ordinary author. Because God wrote it, it is of the utmost importance. You see, sometimes at school we'll have what we have call permission slips. Signed by a parent or legal guardian, I give permission for Johnny to go on the field trip. I saw their work that you sent home, teacher. I noticed the grades that were on the assignments. And wouldn't you know, every once in a great while, a student doesn't necessarily want their parent to see the work they brought home. Oh, they forgot to have their parent sign the note. And so we had had an occasion, very rarely, but occasion where the signature that comes back that has the right letters, but not the right spacing. It's not written the same. It doesn't look to be as authoritative as the scribble of a parent. Is presented as authoritative as this is my parents who said they saw my assignments. Well, that's interesting. I didn't realize that your parents still printed. <laughs> and they couldn't get their E's on the line. And what you're presenting as, presenting as being authoritative is just a farce. Understand that every day we are bombarded by ideas and philosophies and words that are presented to be authoritative. But there is one book that is always authoritative, not because we want it to be, but because God literally breathed out these words. Only God, every single day. You see, because it's God inspired and God breathed, you don't have an ordinary author, and you don't have ordinary results. How is it that reading this book can save a marriage? Right? Can change habits that we've had for years. Can alter beliefs and convictions. Not ordinary results. Can change lives not just one day and two days or three days, but for eternity. 
years and years and years later, while still on this earth, we can look back and we can say that life has been touched by the Word of God. Not ordinary results. The Bible was given from the very thoughts, the very breath of God. Not only is it inspired, but it's interconnected. Amazing thing this Bible is. Second Peter also says this a few verses back, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. What that gives us to is that the Scripture works like this. The Scripture connects like this. From the first page to the last page and everywhere in between, the Scripture goes just like this. Sixty-six different books in the Scripture that we hold, given over 1,600 years apart. 1,600 years. Now, I don't mean to pick on people or to be rude, but you ever notice that the news can't always get it right? even when they have it themselves, what they said the day before? Can you imagine if someone in the news decided to publish a new book over 1,600 years from the beginning to the end and expect this thing to work together and to gloriously and supernaturally be interconnected? 66 books came over 1,600 years. Just by comparison... If the Bible were completed today, it would have started in four, about 422 A.D. You say, wow, that's great. Well, if you waited just about 13 years, Attila the Hun would come onto the scene. That's when it would have started. Right before Attila the Hun came on, he's not around quite yet. We're in the middle of the Dark Ages, and backgammon had not yet been invented. That would be the beginning of the Bible if it were to be completed tonight, today. And through it all, the Bible supernaturally agrees. Not only over 1,600 years, 66 different books, across three different continents. It was written in Asia, Africa, and Europe. By over 35 different human authors. Educated, uneducated. Kings, peasants, public officials... Farmers, teachers, and physicians. Different walks of life, different continents, different places. It was written in the wilderness, that's Moses. In the dungeon, that's Jeremiah. In the prison, that's Paul. On a remote island, the Apostle John. Written in times of war, times of peace, times of joy, sorrow, hope, and despair. And three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And through it all, the Bible works just like this. You can't find an error in God's Word. You can't. Read it. Study it. I challenge you to it. God breathed it. It is true. It is not only inspired and interconnected... It is inerrant, marvelously perfect. The Bible is true, historically accurate, scientifically accurate. I've shared some of these things before, but I'd love to share them again. We still have what is called a flat earth movement out there. It boggles my mind. Flat earth movement, still believing the earth is flat. I shared a few weeks back how someone asked a pilot about that. The pilot, realizing what was being asked, gave the response, Oh yes, before we get our license, we are all bound to a promise to never tell the truth. His story and the person said, Oh, and walked away. (laughs) The earth, my friend, is not flat. I don't care who says it is. It can be proven by science, by photographs, and if I had enough money, on a rocket ship, or... I could just turn to God's word and show you it's not flat. I say it's chapter 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. I learned this pretty early on in life. A circle looks like this. This is a square or a rectangle. This is a circle, right? 
K5, circle, circle, ball, ball, orange, orange, square, box. Right? Not rocket scientists. And we can prove it by photographs. We can prove it by people's testimony or by even taking a rocket ship. Or we can just look at the scripture and see that God's word is marvelously perfect and errant. They said you can count the stars. They did. They said you can count the stars until they invented a telescope. And someone counted 1,020 stars. 1,020. Wonder how they did that. One, two, three, four. Hey, whoa, oh, I gotta start over again. Everything moving. And then the telescope. Counted them again. And then they invented a bigger telescope. Counted them again. They invented a bigger telescope. They counted again, and then they stopped. They stopped saying, this is how many stars there are. They now, they now say, this is how many stars we know about. <laughs> you can look at things online about the stars and the solar systems. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The heavens, like we said this morning, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. And you can look at telescope pictures and see the galaxies and all these things, or you could just pick up your Bible. Genesis 15, and he brought him, that is God, to Abraham, and forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. Jeremiah, God said the same thing. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of, my, of David my servant. Hmm. Marvelously perfect. They said this, that the earth sits on the back of a turtle. Now, I can kind of understand the flat earth theory. If you didn't have everything and, and you didn't believe God's word, you could, you could be deceived the earth is flat, right? And I, I, I could understand that. I could see the counting the stars and you had no technology and you didn't trust God's word. You could say, well, that's what I see. There must not be anything else. But the back of a turtle? Of all the creatures, of all God's creation, a turtle. Why not like a lion? Right? Something like strong, but a turtle? A turtle walking across a road, you get near it, if it gets scared, it pulls itself in, right? A turtle. The earth sits on the back of a turtle. Come on now, get creative about this. We could believe that. And I hope you don't. We could look at, again, pictures, satellite images, take a rocket ship, or we could read the Bible. Job chapter 26, he stretcheth out the north over the empty, empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. <laughs> God said back in the book of Job, the earth just hangs on nothing. Kind of like he knew what he was talking about like he created it or something. It's marvelously perfect. Homer's Odyssey. There are 2,000 manuscripts of Homer's Odyssey, and yet people will look to that for the history and trust those manuscripts. And Aristotle, who was regarded as an ancient and wise philosopher, we have less than 10 copies of his work. And people will spend a lifetime studying Aristotle poetics. Maybe you've heard of Socrates. You heard of Socrates before? Another famous philosopher. You know that we have none of his writings? Only thing we know about him was written down by Plato. And over the Bible, we have over 6,000 manuscripts and portions of manuscripts. You say, well, Pastor, I've, I've heard that we don't have the originals. You would be accurate in that. We don't have, quote, the originals. But you know that we can quote or we can trace what we have back to A.D. 120 or within one century of when they were penned? Within a hundred or less years of when they were penned, we can trace back manuscripts and manuscript fragments. You say, well, that's nice. 
Aristotle Poetics, the earliest writings we have of the ten copies, we can trace back to only 1,400 years from the date they were written. And the Bible, within one generation. Socrates, we don't have anything written down. Homer's Iliad, over 2,000 years. Earliest writings. And the Bible, 120 A.D. 120, two and a half or so decades. You can rely upon the Word of God. And we have here at First Baptist Church, well, why use the King James Bible? Let me tell you something. The other day, someone came into the church who had been watching on television. She came in and, as I'm told the story, said, I need to buy a King James Bible. They asked what her story was, and she said, I'm a Catholic. Catholic Church has been shut down, and someone told me about this guy on TV. I've been watching him, and he said he used a King James Bible, and I want to buy a King James Bible. So one of the secretaries helped, him, helped her buy a Bible. So I'm told the story. She asked what the price was, and they said it was about 16 or so, $20, under $20, $16 or so, somewhere in there. She was surprised because she had been told it would cost $100 to buy a King James Bible. $100. We said, no, you can have it right here for this price. She said, well, here, take the $100 and give it to the church. She said, I like watching your church. I don't agree with everything the pastor says, but I watch it every week. She came up from a place almost 40 plus miles away to buy a King James Bible. God's Word is marvelous. We can trust God's Word. We claim to trust it, yet we never open it. We claim to trust it, yet we never follow it. We claim to trust it, and we never, ever use it. You see, when you trust the Word of God, you will seek daily nourishment from it. When you trust the Word of God, you will want it to permeate your life. When you trust the Word of God, you'll want your decisions to be formulated from God's Word. When you trust God's Word, you view it not as good advice, but God's admonitions. Let me deny it very briefly, very quickly. Give you three decisions to make about the Word of God, and I'll be done. First one, make God's Word a priority. Priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So put down your phone. Turn off Facebook, Parler, or whatever else you decide to use now. And open up the life-breathed Word of God. Put down your fork. Put down your cup of coffee. And pick up the Word of God and make it a priority every single day. During the COVID-19 pandemic back in March, I challenged, or April I think it was, I challenged people to spend time in a psalm in the morning. Rather than picking up the news, paper, TV, or phone, spend time first with God. Read a psalm. You'll be surprised how your mind is centered on Him, not on this. The deception is still the same. Look around you, Jesus. Look inside you. You're hungry. Here's a solution. The deception today is the same. Look around you. It's a crazy place out there, and it's going to get crazier, my friend. Till Jesus comes back, it's probably not going to get much better. All right? Uh, but it's a crazy place. But, but we put a priority on God and His Word. Some have a priority on work. And they will not miss work any single day day. They won't be late for work because work's important. Make a priority for the Word of God. Some will not miss exercise and most will not miss a meal. Make a priority to the Word of God. Make spending time in God's Word a priority every single day. Priority. Number two. Purposeful. Purposeful. David says it this way, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Isaiah says, With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me I will seek thee. Make it purposeful. 
you're not going to accidentally stumble upon godliness. You will not haphazardly grow as a Christian. Not only should you spend time with God and make it a priority, but spend time with God on purpose. Not just where I can fit it in, but where I say, God, this time is you and me. You speak, I'll listen. You breathe your word to me, and I desperately crave it. Priority and purposeful. And last tonight, one more word, make it personal. Make it personal. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Word of God is inspirational. The Word of God is instructional. The Word of God is informative. The Word of God is intensely practical. We say this. We say it's impossible. God says all things are possible. We say I can't go on, and God says my grace is sufficient. We say I can't figure things out, and God says I'll direct your steps. We say I can't do it, and God says you can do all things through me. We say I'm not able. God says I'm able. We say I'm not worth it. God says it will be worth it. We say I can't manage it, and God says, well, I have not given you to manage it. I'll take care of it. We say I'm afraid, and God says don't be afraid. I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. We say, I'm worried and frustrated, and God says, cast your cares upon me. We say, I'm not smart enough, and God says, but I'll give you wisdom. We say, I'm all alone, and God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Word of God is personable, personal. Spend time in God's Word every day. Make it on purpose. But spend, spend time in God's Word until it touches you. It may inspire you. It may create a burning desire inside of you. It may calm you. It may convict you. But it ought to correct you. Spend time until it touches you in the depths of your soul and spirit, in the inner you, in the place that no one else but you and God see. Let God's Word touch you every single day. I wonder, in just a moment I'll have the men pass those out, but just a moment, men, not yet. I wonder, if we were to ask, and we were to be honest, in the past week, how many, time, how many people spent time with God at least once this past week? I would imagine that we would have a fairly decent response. But I wonder if we were to ask how many people in this auditorium on a Sunday night spent time with God, not haphazardly, but on purpose, in a personal way, in God's word, every single day, what their response would be like. I was in college. I believe it was a sophomore. And Pastor Olette preached on this similar topic, this similar theme. And he asked that question. At that time, I was what I considered to be fairly consistent in God's word. Five, six, seven times a week. But he asked a question. I was sitting right over there. Maybe right where the bonders are sitting, right in there. Maybe, maybe Carol, somewhere right in there. The Holy Spirit that night stuck me right here. Because I had missed time with God the day before. Holy Spirit has a way of doing that, doesn't he? And that night, I committed to spend time with God every single day. So that I would go so long that, so that I would come to a place where I could not remember a day that I did not spend time with God. And by God's grace, I cannot remember a day that I have not spent time with God. You say, well, you're the pastor. You have to. No, I'm a Christian. I want to live true life. I have to. It's not because I preach or because I serve here. It's because man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. And men, if you'd pass out those forms, I told you where I'm going, they're going to give you this piece of paper. It looks like this. It'll tear in half 
I'm asking you to commit to a 21-day Bible reading commitment. When I was getting ready for this sermon, I thought, well, what if I put down seven days or 14 days? But I thought, you know what they say? They say that it takes 21 days to create a habit. Just half the time that our Lord was in the wilderness, 21 days. I'm asking everyone to commit to this. If you currently read your Bible every day, I'd like you to still sign your name on this and commit to spend 21 days. Maybe you spend time with God every, every day, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't know where to read in God's Word. I'll help you here. 21 days happens to be the same number of chapters as the book of John. And so what you can do, if you don't know where to read, if you've never spent time with God every single day, then maybe you start by reading tonight, or actually I think it is tomorrow, January 11th, John chapter 1. And on the 12th, John chapter 2. By the end of 21 days, you'll have read through the book of John. What I'm asking you to do is to write your name on that, if you're willing to commit to that, to sign it, and then at the invitation time, to bring it up front to the altar. You might need someone else to bring it up there for you. But if this book is what we say it is, if we claim it like we claim to claim it, if we believe that God gave it to us, should we not spend time with God Every single day. Can you imagine this church, this church, and everyone in this church begin to spend time with God every day? What God could do? What God could do? God's people who claim the name of Jesus Christ begin to walk with God. Boy, our problems, because God's involved. Our life, because God's involved. Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would touch us. Lord, that tonight you'd help us to be challenged by your word. Lord, we cannot live by bread alone. But Lord, sometimes that's the way we try to live. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would touch our hearts. Lord, I'd ask that we would be willing to not only commit to spend time with you every single day, but Lord, give us a grace to do that. Lord, help us in this time. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, again, I would implore you to commit to spend time with God every single day. The reason I asked for it to be more of a visual thing is I am not afraid to stand with God. There are many things we do that are personal, just me and him, and I'll never know if you spend time with God or not. But I'm willing to stand up here and say, you know what? I'll commit 21 days with God, and I'm not afraid to encourage Christians to spend time with God every single day. Lord, bless his invitation. May we respond and obey you and your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, we'll stand. If you commit, I'd ask you to take the top off. Write your name down there and put it right up to the altar. As you commit to spend time with God every single day.
amazing. God's word touches young and old. This year as a family, we're reading a chronological Bible. It's kind of in the order that it, the events happen. We've been talking about what we read from Danielle to James and Johnny and Darina and myself. And each person in their own age, in their own problems and issues, gets something a little bit different from the exact same passage. I love hearing what the Lord touches my kids about and then what he touches my wife about and then I try to share what the Lord touches me about. I'm glad the word of God is not just for kids and not just for adults. It's not just for senior saints and those who have been saved a long time but you've been saved one minute. This book right here. I pray that God will bless his word the next 21 days in your life. Lord, we love you. Lord, I'm humbled by those who would commit to spend time with you, Lord, the next 21 days every single day. Lord, I pray that you would, like you always do, would not let your word return void. Lord, I pray that I'm sure there are some who have not been consistent before in your word. I pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, let them see the life that you bring, the excitement and the thrill. Inspire them, Lord. Touch them. Lord, I can only imagine, I can't even imagine what you would do through this church of those if our hearts are all turned towards you. Lord, use us, but change us. Make us like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.